we'll good, a good afternoon and welcome to our Google Plus Hangout as we take a look head on at concussions. We've got a very distinguished panel for you today to answer some questions and talk about this important topic. And let me start by getting them to introduce themselves. Let's start with Dr. McMurtry. Tell them about yourself, what you're doing, and, and, uh, and then we'll go down the line. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm Dr. Sean McMurtry. I'm a family medicine physician. I uh, did an extra fellowship year in sports medicine, so I'm a sports medicine trained uh, primary care physician. I've done the impact uh, concussion certification testing, and so I'm familiar with the uh, impact testing for concussions uh, as well as sports injuries in, gen in general. I'm at uh, Max Health Family Medicine here in Colleyville, Texas, uh, working with some of the local athletes uh, uh, in this area. So thanks for having me on. Okay, Dr. I'm Dr. Mark Barisa. I'm a board certified clinical neuropsychologist with Baylor Institute for Rehabilitation in Dallas and in Frisco. And I've got about 17 years background in um, neurological injury, including brain injury and concussion. And uh, I too work with impact systems as well as paper and pencil testing with a number of teams in the area here as well as with general referrals in the community. And Dr. Barry, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm uh, Robert Barry. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in sports medicine, uh, the director of sports medicine at Baylor Plano Regional Medical Center here in Plano, Texas. Um, I was a team physician with the San Diego Chargers in uh, 2004 to 2005 and then 2010-2011. Uh, also uh, been team physician with X Games and uh, Red Bull X Fighters and worked with a lot of uh, athletes in uh, all capacity for, for many years now and uh, uh, cover some local high schools and athletes here in Texas now. And it means you got to see LaDainey and Tomlinson run, a TCU kid, right? Absolutely. Uh, great man. Uh, probably even a better man than he is a football Very good. player. And we all know uh, what a great football player he was, so I enjoyed my time. Well, let's start by just taking a look at I think for folks, they want to know exactly what that is. Dr. McMurtry, why don't, why don't you take that one? And if anybody wants to chime in, please go ahead. Okay, could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, just tell us what a concussion is. Just explain to folks what exactly is a concussion. Sure. Uh, so a concussion is an injury to the brain, uh, simply put. Uh, it can happen from direct impacts. It can happen from rotational uh, forces being hit from the side. Uh, that's not necessarily a direct impact, but uh, essentially it's an injury to the brain. It's most often a, more of a functional injury as opposed to a structural injury. Welcome back. I'm Richard Dura. We've got our panel, and we're going to continue with concussions, taking a look at some of the long-term effects of concussions. And Dr. Barisa, you see a lot of folks. Uh, talk about what you see in the weeks after a concussion, even the months and even years. What kind of long-term effects can happen off, off of something happening on the field of play? You know, I think that's a, a, a little more complicated question than it initially sounds. There's so much variability in, in the athletes that we see in terms of the, the nature and the severity of the kind of difficulties they present with. And, and we've kind of come full circle. Back when, when I was an athlete in my much younger days, I'm afraid, uh, you know, when a concussion, a concussion occurred, and even if someone lost consciousness, I mean, it was simply you get the smelling salts, you wake them up, you make sure they don't have too much double vision, and you put them back in the game. Yeah, you know, we've come full circle now with a lot of coverage that would indicate even a single you know, concussion to the head results in long-term severe types of deficits that, that are unrecoverable. And we've almost kind of gone over to the other side. Somewhere in between is that balance. And, and as I mentioned before, you're roughly only 10% of these or less are going to have loss of consciousness, are going to have obvious, wow, this person's out. So when we look at the long-term effects, we do monitor symptoms such as headache, sleep disturbance, emotional problems, personality changes, uh, balance issues. All of these things certainly are high points that we're going to be looking at. But the other side of this is to remember that most of the, the kids that we see are going to make a full recovery, and they're going to do so in relatively short order. Uh, what we see on the television with the media coverage and things like that is actually a minority. It is a very small minority of these cases. So there's three factors we look at. Number one, symptom-free at rest. Number two, symptom-free with exertion. And then number three, a return to a presumed baseline level of cognitive function. Um, 
having the best people on board to monitor these things certainly is is a part of that with neuropsychology, neurology, neurosurgery, sports medicine. People train specifically in the area of brain injury and recovery. In terms of the long-term effects, there is is a great deal of new research. I mean, this is this is the buzzword now, right? I mean, we, we see multiple CNN reports. We see people covering these things with regularity now. Uh, anytime an athlete has a bad behavior, yeah, immediately we start to wonder, is it too many concussions or, or these kind of things? So somewhere, again, within that, we, we need to get better information. And there's some work being done now with things like cr chronic traumatic encephalopathy, you know, long-term effects of concussions. We've known about a condition called dementia pugilistica in boxers for quite some time, and that's a breakdown of the brain from repeated injuries to the head. And there's a symptom profile that goes with that. But now I think we're getting better at looking at more of the subtleties. Uh, one of the words that's been used frequently is the fogginess that can be associated or headaches that can linger. So I do have athletes that have multiple injuries, multiple concussions, that have long-term residual difficulties, and we do have to retire those individuals from play oftentimes after too many concussions. But the key with proper management, without returning them to play too soon, and making sure that, that they're getting the appropriate evaluation and care, most of these individuals will be able to go back to their activities without, without I'm not going to say without any risk, but, but with, with less risk than would be anticipated in terms of, of long-term deficits. Just for any of you, and, and Dr. Barry, if, you, if you're there, you can answer this probably too, but talk about some of the equipment and some of the changes and, and modifications that have been made to try to guard against concussions. We talk a lot about football helmets, and I know they've really changed throughout the years to try to be better uh, at protecting the head, but what, what else is out there and what do you see coming in the future that, that can better protect athletes against concussions? The, uh, the thing with equipment is that, uh, you know, as we all know, no rules or, uh, you know, pieces of equipment are going to uh, remove the, uh, the risk of participating in contact or collision sports and, you know, reducing the risk of concussion to zero certainly can de decrease things. Um, you know, the helmets are something, especially in football, that we talk about. I think Virginia Tech has done some good research there. Lots of us are aware of that and the uh, star ratings for the helmets. You have to be a little bit careful with that because what happens now is the school districts, the parents read some of this stuff, and of course, then they want their football uh, team and the school to go out and buy the what's determined the latest and greatest, maybe based on the rating system of the Virginia Tech uh, data. And so, uh, I think that you know helmets are certainly part of the uh, process in decreasing risk of concussion. As we all know, that's a lot of education. One of the things that uh, I think you know, we talk about is that if you really wanted a helmet uh, to protect and against concussions, you'd have to have something be so big that it would be prohibitive to even play, you know, something be like 10 times the size of our current helmets to actually absorb that impact, much like in a car that gets in an accident having, you know, uh, crush spaces to absorb the force. That's not practical. I think there's a lot of people that think back when we had the leather helmets, uh, before we even had face masks, and before people started using their helmets as weapons to tackle, that we may have had even less concussions. You know, you can look at sports like rugby uh, where people aren't wearing helmets that, you know, cut, uh, helmets can be helpful at decreasing injuries, but I would argue, and I think some of my colleagues, that some of the helmets sometimes can increase the risk of concussion only for the fact that it gives a false, a false sense of security to athletes and they use those helmets as weapons. So to summarize that, there's good helmets out there. I think you don't probably want the one that's rated the lowest in the star ratings from Virginia Tech, but probably one in the middle there is okay. You don't need to rush out and have your entire football team uh, or your booster club buy new helmets. I think probably every uh, – uh, one thing I would add, though, is if you have an athlete that has had a concussion, uh, uh, evaluating that helmet that they're using and considering whether or not that helmet should be retired and replaced, I think that's something important to consider. Yeah, I think another point, especially with the youth football, is oftentimes these these very young athletes are getting ill-fitting helmets. And Absolutely. so you've got a helmet that's not fitting a peewee football player appropriately. And sometimes it's like, well, he'll grow into it. Well, that's that's not a good compromise on this one. You know, growing into shoulder pads is one thing. Growing into a helmet that's trying to avoid an injury to the head is something very different. And then the other piece of that is is to consider, you know, one of the points Dr. Barry makes is is sometimes helmets can be a negative 
in, in the context of the way an athlete plays. But when you think about small peewee football players, when you put a helmet on a kid, he looks like a bobblehead because he has his very little body in this big, heavy head with a big, heavy helmet. And part of the risk factor in concussion is the strength of the neck and the neck's ability to, to withstand the impact of something striking it or a whiplash type of effect. So even if the head is not hit, if a running back is getting tackled at a high rate of speed and the head is jolted, uh, that also can cause injury if the neck is not strong enough to, to hold the head in place. And that's oftentimes what we even see in sports such as soccer, lacrosse, and some of these other high velocity sports. Football gets a lot of attention, but some of these other sports also are very vulnerable and, and the protection factor is, it needs to be balanced in that respect too. All right, well, gentlemen, we really appreciate your time and talking about concussions and letting at least parents and even kids know what they need to look out for. We appreciate it. This has been a Google Plus Hangout head-on on concussions. Thanks for joining us.